Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. Although we love shade when temperatures hit sweaty numbers, one of our top questions is how to garden under its cover. Today, May Sanchez from Barton Springs Nursery has a few ideas to give you a sunnier outlook with shade plants. On tour, let's visit a garden that goes up front. This Green Garden Award winner actually begins in the front yard. Since 2005, when Cherry Cordry and Paul Mayer moved in with their family, they've turned the front yard into the neighborhood bistro and playground. It was a desert. We had three trees and just grass, that was all. And it was very plain, very boring, uh, and incredibly large. And in front of the house, there were these great big fatinias that they must have been seven feet tall, and they were right up against the house and blocked all the sun. And then there were some uh, purple sages. And my husband, Paul, um, I mean, they were just, they, they weren't doing very well. And so he uh, got his truck, put a chain around them, and just yanked them out. It was a pickup, this uh, <laughs> Ford Explorer. I thought <laughs> he was crazy ground. when he told me he was going to do that, but it worked really well. <laughs> the neighbors quick. were like, yeah, Paul. <laughs> I wanted a social space that would be um, a place where we could sit and enjoy the sunset, uh, have uh, some privacy, but yet we have a little boy and we wanted to be able to see him as he played on the street with the other kids, because this is a cul-de-sac, and, uh, and yet not be on display. So we planned uh, this patio with bushes and trees around it that provided privacy, but also had view spaces. We wanted to do a different um, entryway. Um, there was just a, a sidewalk that was done with concrete. Um, and uh, so I wanted to have look at the house and have the fountain in front of us and then go through the trees and go out and, and redirect the, the, the sidewalk. So you actually walk through the space. It's really great that we can sit out here have a glass of wine, have dinner, have coffee, and see our neighbors and wave at them. And the and neighbors come over quite yeah, often and join us. And, and It's made uh, for a real good social environment on the, on the street. I knew that I wanted a real defined structure to the garden, and that's why we have the vertical, the vertical lines and height. But then I wanted the agaves and the sharpness and the gray, and then some softness to soften it all out. I like the grays and whites because in the summer it's cooling to look at. But yet we didn't want to give up color. We've also tried to incorporate things that will bloom by the seasons. So we're going for coolness and low water use and easy maintenance. And then I'm a plant person, you know, I like one of this, one of that. And uh, I had talked with a, a designer, a local designer here in town, uh, Nancy Weber, and she really stressed to me that with a big house, you needed to have several plantings of the same. Nancy was uh, very helpful to encourage us to make the, the beds big and white and, uh, and connect them all. So Sherry was, uh, had a great time going through her books and, and finding <laughs> all kinds of uh, um, the different vegetation and plants for, for the garden. And, um, and we haven't stopped yet. We're still <laughs> I still uh, come home I'm and uh, it's like there's another up. 20 plants. It's like, Sherry, you got to stop. <laughs> well, that's probably not going to happen as long as Sherry owns a shovel. Some plants work well where I put them the first time, but then I keep telling Paul, you know, gardening is you've got to, you have to find the right place for your plant. And you do the best you can the first time, but it may not work out, and so you move it. Like I have agaves, you would think, the toughest, hardest plants around, and there are certain areas in the garden that they, they don't like it. It's too much water, not enough drainage, and, and so they've died there. And, uh, and where I've been able to rescue them and move them to a, a, a less friendly environment, or a, a drier environment anyway. 
when I first came to the, to the United States, I lived in a very suburban neighborhood and it was all St. Augustine and very few plants. So, you know, coming from Germany with, with such a rich vegetation uh, we've had, and uh, I, it, it, it took me a while to discover this here and, and, uh, and establish that, uh, a richness in, in, in landscaping. When I look at pictures from the spring, from last year and, and this year, it's completely different. And whatever is today, it's going to be totally different next year again. Just the richness, the fullness that, that we actually have whole walls that are green now. And we don't just look at a fence that, are, that is a cedar fencing, but it is a lot of vegetation on it. And it's, it's every day, I mean, changing and, and, and pretty to look at. Some of the other neighbors have started to also take up their front yards and, and, and plant, take up the grass, put things at the median, and, uh, and so we're going to start a garden club and we're going to focus on uh, zero escape, low water use, design, adaptive plants. I really encourage people to do more gardening in the front yard, to, if, to make a social space where they can feel comfortable so that they can get to meet their neighbors so they can play in the front yard with their kids or you know hang out with their friends and that's made such a change in getting to know people and really uh, using the space that supports the way you want to live. All right thanks for opening your garden gates for us and right now we're going to be talking about brightening up those shady corners. And joining me is May Sanchez from Barton Springs Nursery. Yep. And uh, great to have you back on the program, thanks, May. Thanks for having me. Always fun. Yep. And uh, always you always bring along such great plants All with right. you. I couldn't decide. I just grabbed a bunch on my way out. <laughs> There's so much to look at right now. Yeah, well, this is the time of year. And, you know, Barton Springs Nursery, always known for being kind of native plant headquarters. Mm -hmm. But uh, so many cool things that are available there, tropical as well, mm -hmm. things that, have, uh, that you've learned over the years that are really well adapted for Central Texas. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the tough situations. People do have lots of shade to deal with and adding interest in the shade is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. So you depend on lots of different leaf forms and Textures colors. Textures and yeah. Yeah. Um, everybody's looking for that full sun or that uh, shady plant that'll bloom year round and, <laughs> and deer resistant and all that. But right. You, you have to sacrifice color sometimes for texture or form right. or something like right. that. Well, speaking of texture, but uh, bringing along some color, uh -huh. lots of variegated plants that work well in the shade. And we have a couple of grassy ones we're going to start with. Mm -hmm. This is uh, called Aztec grass. Mm -hmm. It's a form of variety. Yep, it's a pretty common landscape plant around yeah. here. It's been around for a while, but that's mm -hmm. because it's so tough. Um, variegated plants are just a good way to brighten up a corner in the yard mm -hmm. or um, just a shady area, yeah. draw the eye to that. Uh, Aztec grass is a great kind of border plant if you wanted mm -hmm. to line a bed with it. Blooms in the summer, little white All right. blooms. All right. I, I like it a whole lot because of exactly what we're talking about. Because in, in a shady situation, this kind of cream colored foliage will pop out. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's really tough. It is evergreen. It is. This past winter it took a little bit of a hit, but yeah. not much. You, okay, I would it say maybe back. one in ten winters you'll have to cut it to the ground yeah. or something like Which that. Is but okay. it will come back. Yep. And it's, it's just a really terrific plant, and White one that and is easy to find and affordable as yes, well. Yes, it's pretty, pretty common, and most nurseries are going right. to have that. But yeah, and you can start it from a gallon pot or a four-inch pot, mm -hmm. you know, really it's a, great. It can get a couple feet high if you let it, if it's yeah. in really good soil. So. Yeah. Now, uh, a very similar-looking plant, but uh, one that it has an even finer texture, mm -hmm. and I really like this plant a whole lot mm -hmm. for it, the kind of tufting mound that it creates. Yep. And I can tell just by touching this, it's a sedge. It's a sedge, K-Rex. Yeah. Um, it's a great, K-Rex is a great hardy genus for mm -hmm. the shade. A lot of them are shade tolerant. This has a real bold variegation. It's mm -hmm. the yellow and green. And this is, what? which form is this? It's the uh, ver variegated Japanese, Japanese Yeah, more Variegated more Japanese OEI. sedge. And, uh, uh, deer resistant, evergreen. Um, they're usually more cold tolerant than heat tolerant, if anything. So mm -hmm. definitely shade in the summer, especially. Mm -hmm. 
A little extra water will keep them looking good. Yeah. Um, they're pushing off their blooms right now just for more contrast. Right. It's another thing variegated plants are good for is contrasting with other, you know, exactly. they bring out color exactly. in other plants. Well, I'm, I really, really mm -hmm. like the look of this, uh, the, 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 the fine bladed foliage and, and the, the, the kind of, you know, very regular kind of variegation with a bold center stripe mm -hmm. on it is really cool. It's a little more expensive, and it looks great planted in mass. Yeah. Um, but it's worth it for yeah. if you have shade that you're dealing with in deer. Right. Well, if you've got All deer, those. you don't have many options, so this might yeah. be a great one. Yep. So look for the variegated Japanese sedge. Now, another variegated <clears throat> plant that you brought along, one of my all-time favorites, is the variegated ginger. Mm -hmm. A little and, more, t a little more tender. Yes, in definitely the on the tender side during the winter time, but beautiful during the summer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and it, it's big. It's you know, it can take up a large area in the garden or a bed. Right. Planted around oak trees, even. Mm -hmm. um, but it can get up four feet tall, sometimes taller if it's protected enough. Right. And uh, it's it's got that kind of golden kind of color mm -hmm. to it, uh, which is, uh, I think, really stunning. And uh, again, I, I like to plant these in group, uh, odd numbered groups, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of really quickly provides that kind of naturalistic look in mm -hmm. a garden, very soft uh, kind of quality, and again, brightening up a, a dark corner. Uh, so variegated ginger, kind of a long time favorite now in area air gardens. Yep. Next to that, we have uh, a little monster that I, I love this plant, it's bamboo grass. Uh -huh. Or uh, palm grass, palm it's also grass. called. There you uh -huh. go, palm grass, thank you. It has these more... accordion-like leaves that yeah. will open and close right. depending on some right. moisture content. And this one, let me tell you folks, this is, uh, this is uh, a, a little bit uh, on the aggressive side. But uh, you got you got to love it. It's just a, I think a stunning stunning uh, grass. Yeah, it can get about this tall. It blooms in the late summer, mm -hmm. um, maybe three to four feet. I guess when it's four blooming. Feet, yeah, four feet and tall. And then the seeds. Yeah. If you let it go to seed, it'll go to seed and pop it, up in yeah. the surrounding areas. But it's easy to rip out. If you it need. is. It is easy to control, and um, it, it's not like you know a nasty foreign invader. But it, it is definitely one. That you can count on uh, reproducing itself. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's good if you got this far. You can share it. Right. Transplant right. it. But beautiful form, perfect for the shade. Yeah. Now, to answer the the question about color in the shade, mm -hmm. meaning bloom, you've brought an assortment of different salvias, and, uh, appropriately red, white, and blue salvias oh, here. I didn't even realize I did that. They, uh, well, we have uh, a couple different forms of the tropical sage. Mm -hmm. What looks to me, the white and the red. Uh huh. The salvia coccinea. A lot of people think of salvias as being full sun plants, right. salvia gray guys kind of sure. all over the place here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's tough. Right. Um, but there's several salvias that can tolerate shade and bloom in the shade. Mm -hmm. They might grow a little differently, a little, a little bit taller than they would in the shade. Mm -hmm. Their leaves will be a little bit bigger and greener, um, but they'll still bloom for you. Salvia coccinea, the red and white, it also comes in pink and white, a, pink, a bicolor one. Um, they will reseed for you as well, okay. pretty prolifically, at least yeah. the red one will that I know of. And then next to it we have the blue salvia garanitica, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and that one is called black and blue, right? Mm -hmm. For the black calyx with the blue bloom. And this, the color on that one, I have to say, is my all-time favorite flower color in the garden. I just, that Royal blue, blue is just, almost. it's just spectacular, mm -hmm. rich, deep blue, really love that plant. That's another good one that, you know, it will spread also. We were talking about that earlier. It spreads yeah. by rhizomes, so yeah. you do need to control that if you don't have the space for it, but it's right. easy enough put a, to do. Put a border around it and you yeah. can keep it in check. Yeah. It yep. works really, really well. You can use stone or anything else that goes under the soil just a little bit and will keep it from spreading out. Deer resistant, too. All of the salvias tend to be. That's an important point. Yeah. Important point. Another one of the gingers, and this is the shell pink, right, that we're looking at? Um, shell ginger, yeah, it has a pink, really uh, un unbelievable bloom if you get it to bloom. It has to have a pretty mild winter to bloom, mm -hmm. so it's every few years we might have it where it doesn't die down all the way and comes back from the roots, but it's basically the non-variegated form of the variegated ginger. Right. 
And oh. it's, you know, again, a graceful form, a really nice tropical kind of look to it. Yeah, that's tall. It can get six feet tall, seven mm -hmm. feet tall easily. Right. It grows great under oak trees or cedar elms mm -hmm. or any dappled shade, light yeah. shade. And when it blooms, it's really showy. Yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. Very, very showy plant. So, again, not every year, but uh, that... Uh, worth, worth the wait. Yeah, just worth the wait for the shell ginger. Here's a plant we ha haven't talked about in a long time, and you know I really like Mahonia. Yeah, and the it's bloom underappreciated. Is, is, I think it's tough. It's a survivor, uh -huh. and has one of the funkiest cool blooms going. Yeah, in the winter, it blooms in the winter usually, late winter. These mm. yellow blooms that'll form these uh, uh, purple-like berries. It's right. also called organ grape is a common name for Mahonia. Right. Um, but this one is especially tough here. Leather leaf. Um, obviously has a thick leather-like leaf, mm -hmm. evergreen, um, you know, he, you can read that it gets t 8 to 10 feet. Here it's going to get, I've never seen one taller than maybe 5 feet or yeah. so. It grows yeah. really slowly. Uh, it gets kind of a grayish leaf color when it's mature. Mm -hmm. um, in dry shade, it doesn't yeah. really need any care at all. A little on the prickly side. Yeah, it is, but, but uh, that's all right. But yeah, it's a, <laughs> it, an easy plant to, to Keep work the kids with, out very forgiving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good, it is a good boundary plant, yeah. is, for sure. Now, to you, that keeps the kids out, this draws them in. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? It's and this is, I just wanted to touch base on this one briefly, because that is such a stunning color. Yeah, I, really I like couldn't resist yellow. bringing it when I saw it. It pops out, and, and it's shade tolerant in, mm -hmm. the, in a shade garden that'll just And this is a your... lemon rose mallow. Uh -huh, it's a hibiscus. In mm -hmm. hibiscus Obviously family, hibiscus cardiophyla. with this foliage and mm -hmm. this bloom, right? Um, die down, dies down in the winter, comes back most winters, mm -hmm. root hardy. Right, right. And blooms all summer, on the, and off. This is loaded with buds. It's just now starting. Yeah, the, lots of different forms of rose mallow. Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. Lots of different colors. Yep. And the, but I the know yellow's the great carry, for the shade. Yeah, 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 this would really pop out in the shade. Yeah. Now, you, real briefly, tell me about this. It's called Red Dragon. Red Dragon, Persicaria. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of a sprawling, root-hardy perennial. Uh -huh. It's going to get maybe two, maybe three feet tall and mm -hmm. probably three to four feet wide. And it's just now starting to bloom these delicate white okay. blooms uh, all summer long. Okay. Well, little tiny blooms, beautiful foliage, a nice sprawling plant for mm -hmm. the shade. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, May, you've brought along a lot of inspiration for, uh, for right. these dark corners. And yeah. I hope folks will visit you at Barton Springs Nursery. Thanks a lot. All right. Always good to see you. you and too. coming up next, it's Daphne Richards. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week is about when and how much to water new plants. Well, until they are established, they do need quite a bit more water than once they're rooted in. So you do need to pay a lot of attention to the weather and perhaps the rainfall, which we may not be getting this time of year. High temperatures will cause the plant to need more water, and that's pretty obvious. But you also need to watch the intensity of the sun. As we get later into summer, the sun is brighter and more intense and will burn plants more easily. Small plants will dry up more quickly and be wilty before you know it. So you might go out there one day, it looks great, and the next day it just looks like it's almost dead. This watering will also depend on your soil type. So there are a lot of factors to consider. Can be kind of confusing, but what you, once you get used to your soil, you'll be much better at this. Generally, you should probably water your plants every two to three days when they're new into the ground, especially if they were just planted recently and were already so warm. Be sure to mulch those new plants if you can, being careful that you don't have too much mulch near the stem. If you can, irrigate them in the morning and be very careful to only water the ground, not the leaves. If water is left on the leaves and the sun dries them out, it could be if your water is too salty that they will burn the leaves, those water droplets. After the first summer, the temperatures and the sun are not so intense on the plants into the fall. So you may be able to cut back to once a week once you get your plants through that first summer. You also need to know your plant type, obviously. Perennials, which are not woody, will wilt faster and need more water. Woody plants will not need as much because they can store more in their stems. Be sure to give your plants a thorough soaking onto the ground. Don't just sprinkle some water. Come back around the plant also, go around your whole garden perhaps, and then come back around and water again so that the first watering has time to soak into the soil. Our plant this week is Siberian iris, Iris siberica. There are a lot of great cultivars, but this particular one is ruffled velvet. 
you may have to mail order this plant. I have a spot in my garden that's perpetually wet, which this plant is great for, and it gets virtually no sun. Siberian irises are perfect for this kind of spot. And unlike most full shade plants, these plants have beautiful flowers too. I looked around locally, but the closest plants I could find were Russian irises, which require full sun, not great for my spot. Since these plants need to be wet all the time, they also make great choices for your boggy areas or shady ponds. You can get them in various shades, normally light to deep purples and blues. Ruffled velvet has a deep purple flower and makes a great addition to the foreground of my limestone brick here. They spread to about a foot and a half and get about two feet tall, so they're daintier than traditional irises are. Mine died back to the ground in our extra cold winter this year, but it came roaring back in early April once our temperatures warmed up. To do in your garden this week, think about your container plants that are outdoors and consider mulching them. This is something that people maybe don't remember at this time of year or the plant is in the container so they don't think to mulch it. This will actually insulate the soil. Your containers may need to be watered more than once a day when it gets really hot, but be sure that when you mulch, in a container, maybe an inch to two inches deep, small aggregate mulch, and make sure that that mulch doesn't touch the stem of your plants, if at all possible. That can cause your stems to stay too wet and perhaps to rot. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Meredith Giles for Backyard Basics. Hi friends, Meredith Giles here with Backyard Basics, and today we're going to talk about vines. You know, vines are a huge group of plants. There's lots of different types, but I think there's no better way to get a lot of plant in a very small footprint than a vine. Vines can be grown to cover sheds, to obscure views, or they can just be grown for lots of flowers. There's many, many uses for them. Now there's four main types of vines. There's annuals, perennials, deciduous, and evergreen, just like many other plants. Annual vines would include things like the morning glory, cypress vine, or purple hyacinth bean vine. These are plants that are typically grown from seed. They grow very quickly and have a long bloom period, but come the first good freeze, those plants will die. Now most of these plants are pretty good reseeders, so if you don't disturb the soil too much, you should have them return from seed the next year. Some examples of perennial vines would be the passion vine, coral vine, or Dutchman's pipe. These plants also grow very quickly and have long bloom seasons. They will, however, freeze to the ground in the winter, but they will return from their own roots the next year. Now, on a quick side note, the passion vine and the Dutchman's pipe are not only beautiful flowering plants, they're actually excellent food sources for some of our butterflies. The third type of vine would be a deciduous vine. Much like a deciduous tree, it's going to lose all of its leaves in the winter but it will relief from the original wood the next year, so you're not having to start over from the ground. You've got your full plant there. And finally, there are the evergreen vines, and they're just that, green all year. Now, most evergreen vines do have a shorter bloom period than an annual or a perennial, but they're great if you need coverage. And some great examples of evergreen vines would be star jasmine, cross vine, our native coral honeysuckle, or fig vine. Now when considering where you're gonna plant a vine, one thing you need to keep in mind is you're going to need something for the vine to grow on. Most vines are gonna need some kind of structure that they can wrap themselves around. It could be a chain link fence, a trellis, or perhaps something that you rig up yourself with some bamboo poles or some wire, anything that that vine can wrap around. Some vines actually have tendrils that they use to reach out and grab to pull themselves up, if you'll think of it that way. There are a few vines that can actually grow directly on material like a rock wall. The fig vine would be a great example of that. Plant it close to a stucco wall, brick, something of that nature, and it will grab right on and grow right up. One question we get asked a lot is what is a good flowering vine for the shade? Well, there's really not a great flowering vine for the shade, 
Plants like star jasmine will do all right in a bright shade, perhaps under a large tree or a place that gets a little morning sun, but there really aren't many great flowering vines for heavy shade. Now vines like the fig vine, big ivy, or the Virginia creeper, a native plant, they do do well in the shade, and those are great plants to put in that area. But you're not gonna get a whole lot of blooming from a vine in the shade. Like any other plant, vines can be trimmed, particularly evergreen vines. If you're looking for a green fence, once they get to that top, be sure to trim them a little bit. That'll encourage them to branch out lower and stay nice and full. Also with annual vines like the morning glory, you can deadhead them to prevent a lot of spreading if you have too much seed. It also will encourage more blooms. Also, keep in mind that a perennial vine like a passion vine is going to freeze in the winter. You will want to come in after that first good freeze and remove all the dead material that's on your trellis. Again, it will return from the roots the next year, but that dead material can be kind of unsightly in the wintertime. This is Meredith Giles with Backyard Basics talking about vines. Check out klru.org ctg to watch online, get more tips, and to read our blog. Next week, cool down with hot weather color. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org ctg.